Welcome to The Savvy Sauce, where we have practical chats for intentional living. I'm your host, Laura Duggar, and I'm so glad you're here. Today's message is not intended for little ears. We'll be discussing some adult themes, and I want you to be aware before you listen to this message. I am thrilled to introduce you to our sponsor, Windshape Marriage. Their weekend retreats will strengthen your marriage, and you will enjoy this gorgeous setting, delicious food, and quality time with your spouse. To find out more, visit them online at windshapemarriage.org. That's W-I-N-S-H-A-P-E marriage.org. Thanks for your sponsorship. Gary Thomas has been a guest on The Savvy Sauce three times, and each episode of his becomes one of our most popular of the year. In this episode, which became our seventh most downloaded in 2022, he skillfully weaves stories, examples, and questions together to reveal wise ways we can intentionally stay connected in marriage. Much of this is included in his latest book, Making Your Marriage a Fortress. So whether you're a newlywed or you've been married over 60 years, I believe you will appreciate the wisdom he has us call to mind. Here's our chat. Welcome back to the Savvy Sauce, Gary. Thank you, Laura. So good to talk to you again. And I just want to say well done with another fantastic book. And I always find your books easy to read and packed with helpful material. I want you just to elaborate on these quotes I'm going to put together that you write about on page 109, writing about a spiritually healthy marriage, where you say, Satan is most likely to attack your marriage exactly where you are most negligent. We don't get to choose where our enemy decides to attack. So Gary, how can we stay on guard? Well, we can go one of two ways. I love what C.S. Lewis said when he said there are some people who are superstitious. They find Satan and demons under every pillow, and he goes, that's not healthy. But then he used a word I'd never heard of before. He warned about him being substitious, never considering that we have a spiritual enemy who plots to bring us down, who discourages us, who accuses us, who's trying to pull us apart. And so the reality is if we know we're at war Why wouldn't we put up our guards? Not to be overly fearful because we have a shepherd and a God who loves us and protects us and will walk us through everything, but also to recognize, you know, it's not unwise to put up a fence now and then or to lift up a shield to guard against. So I think one of the things that we can do is to be conscientious about building relational skills to improve our marriage. So many people today think a good marriage is about a good match. You find the right partner, you get together, you're in love happily ever after, and everything flows from there. But the reality is what most pulls couples apart is a lack of relational skills. And those are things that you can grow in. Communication, listening, how to resolve conflict, remembering to have fun and making that intentional, growing in sexual intimacy. These are relational skills. It's not about the matching It really is sort of about, I can become a better listener. I can put more effort into us having fun and building a sense of humor in our relationship. It's learning that we need those relational skills to prepare for the future storm. And it's really one of the premises of this book, Laura, that the storms will hit. We don't know what the storms will be. And that's why it's just wise to build our lives accordingly so that when the storms do hit, We're not caught unprepared. Let me give an example of a couple who had a very difficult time conceiving children, and then they lost their only son. He was 19 when he died. It was a tragic set of events. And that morning, she called a few friends. The block was filled with cars. She grabs one of her friends and says, look, I know in 70% of the time, this destroys marriages. You've got to help us keep our marriage together. And there was this understandable concern. I've lost my son. 
please don't let me lose my marriage. I'm asking you to step up. And because they had built such strong church connections, their house was filled and people were there. Not a day went by when she probably wasn't getting five or six or 10 or 12 text messages encouraging her, speaking God's word into her life, giving her scriptural verses. Laura, I was just amazed at how they applied their faith. I can't even imagine losing a child, much less losing my only child. Because when Garrett died, they knew the hopes of having grandkids would die. The hopes of having a daughter-in-law would die. The hopes of watching how God would use him would die. And I was talking to Janelle, asking them how they were dealing with it. And she said to me, Gary, God didn't just call Garrett from us. He called Garrett to something. And I know today, Garrett is fully, perfectly serving his heavenly father in heaven in his glorified state. She was my friend's kids. They bring a lot of grief. They might have issues with the daughter-in-laws. Some kids might be getting involved in drinking or having financial issues or kids are getting sick. She goes, we don't have any of that. We know Garrett is perfectly serving the Lord, walking in holiness, doing exactly what God created him to do because she knew scripture. And she knows to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. It wasn't just a belief to her. It's not just theology that she had memorized. It was giving her present hope in the face of tremendous pain. And that church carried her through. And it's so easy to say, well, church is okay if we're not doing too much on Sunday or if we're not tired on Sunday. So we don't really get connected. We might kind of attend, but we're not really involved not realizing that the day may come when we desperately need those relationships at church. And so it's wise to cultivate church relationships, even if you don't feel like you need them, because the day will come when you're attacked, when you actually will need them. I think the other thing is just to do our homework personally, our personal work to become stronger. One of the guys I talked to had had a really strong sex addiction for a number of years. It was exposed, which he said he thought at first was the worst day of his life. He looks back and he says, I think it was one of the best days of my life because it put him into recovery. And Laura, he took it seriously. He was in 12-step groups. He got a professional licensed counselor. He was doing quarterly uh, lie detector tests with a guy trained where his wife could ask him any question he wanted. He was working with others. And so he was really experiencing a new freedom, a new sense of life. And they were beginning to have a new marriage. 18 months after he entered recovery, his daughter was diagnosed with leukemia. And it was potentially life-threatening. And his wife had to spend so much time at the hospital with his daughter. He was there with his two boys. And both he and his wife told me, we would not have survived if I still had that addiction. It was sucking up so much energy. I couldn't be there for my wife. And he's just almost breaking down. I wouldn't have been there for my daughter just when she needed me the most. I wouldn't have been there for my sons. I would have wanted to be acting out to deal with the anxiety and the pressure and whatnot. And Lord, he was so, so grateful that he had been exposed and gotten healed and was walking in the grace and mercy and victory and recovery offered by Jesus Christ so that he could be there for his family because in his ideal world, he wanted to be there for his wife. He wanted to be there for his kids, but he had to get free to do that. And so many of the listeners might have this little addiction going on the side. It, it could be porn. It could be food. It could be excessive video gaming. You name it. And you can get by with it. It makes you weaker. You know it's making you weaker, but you can survive. But when the storm hits... That's when you realize, okay, now I need to be at my strongest. I, I need to be at my best, not just for me, but to be there for my spouse, to be there for my kids. And so all of these couples just talked about the, the richness of God's word, the power of God's word, the sustenance of God's word, that by building that up when they really needed it, the word was right there and it helped them to be strong. Your storm is coming. Maybe it's already here. So make sure you have a strong church community. Do the personal work so that you'll be free and strong to give yourself to your family and be steeped in the word. It may not feel like you need it now, 
but you will. And when you find out that you need it, you'll find out it is more than sufficient. It is amazing. It's powerful. It's God's words to you. And beyond even these couples that you interviewed for the book, you've helped countless couples through your years of ministry. So what have you encountered as the most common marital pitfalls? I think one of the most common, I just think myths is what I would call it that I hear today is that if we're a good match, we don't need to work out. It's all about finding the right person. And when we're infatuated, Laura, it just, we just don't get as irritated. We naturally put in energy to affirm each other, to touch, to give gifts, to resolve conflict. We couldn't imagine sleeping if there was a possibility of any type of estrangement with somebody we're infatuated. So we found a good match and it seems perfect. And so we think we don't need to work at it. One of the couples I, I talked to was Randy and Hannah. They're up in Canada and their life was just completely transformed when COVID hit because of what Randy does. And I called them in the book a relationally industrious couple because so many people say, oh, you guys have such a great match. You have such a great marriage. You're so lucky. And they're honest and saying, luck has absolutely nothing to do with it. But they have three different check-ins. They have the fun night every week. Something they do is fun. They have a second, what they call their business meeting, because they realize if they don't have the business meeting, the fun night will be taken up by business talk. Do we pay this bill? Do we need to fix that faucet? You know, are the kids going to do this? How are we going to pay for college? What are we doing for investing? What not? So they have that. And then they have the daily check-ins because for them, it's just so important to stay connected. Now, Randy has found out very wisely, he knows his wife, that his wife does much better on the daily check-ins when she's been fully caffeinated. So he gets her cup of coffee, he lets her sit for 15 minutes, and then they come in. And that might just be five or 10 minutes. But that five or 10 minute investment makes them feel connected. And so when I looked at other couples similar to Randy and Hannah, I think one of the common marital pitfalls today is just busyness. And so the couples that survived were ruthless with threats to their marriage. They limited what their kids could do. One husband who just raves about the intimacy of his marriage in all aspects of the marriage told me he works three days a week. And his office is five minutes from home, so he can have lunch at home most often. He goes, yeah, we drive older cars. We have a smaller house. We can't afford a lot. He goes, but you know what? I wouldn't give it up because I I wanted to be connected to my kids. I love being connected to my wife. In the end, I think we've chosen what is best. Busyness can be not just bad things. It can be wonderful things like having a baby. Les Parrott has a quote I love. When you give birth to a new baby... You're giving birth to a new marriage. I mean, most of us don't have enough time. Now, you put a baby in there, and I want to say to couples who are pregnant, okay, what are you going to take out of your life? And they're like, what do you mean? So, what, what, do you think you get another six hours a day because you give birth to a baby? <laughs> Babies don't take care of themselves. You're going to have to take something out choose what you're going to sacrifice. Otherwise, it just happens ad hoc and often you might regret it. And then to fight busyness, it could be with vocation. I talked to a couple, Baron and Christina. Baron's a military chaplain and he's often gone on deployments. One time it was stateside and it was sort of a training thing. So he was with a lot of his buddies and they were going out to restaurants in San Diego and whatnot. And there's three or four nights in a row until finally his wife, Christina, said, hey, hey Baron, we haven't even connected for several days. And I love the way that Baron was able to take correction because he realized I would never, if I was at home with my wife and kids, go out three nights in a row and leave them at home. So just because I'm on the road, it's not appropriate to not be checking in, to not have a long phone call or a FaceTime call or whatnot. I'm still married even when I'm not living in the same time zone as my wife. And so These couples were ruthless about being too busy. They were intentional about staying connected because they realized we live in a world that seems to force us apart if we're not fighting back against it. That is so timely to call that to mind. And 
that's interesting. You've narrowed it down to that busyness is such a common pitfall and your examples were so helpful. Are there any other replicable traits that you've observed in healthy and spiritually vibrant marriages? Yeah, this is two things. The first is going to sound like a cliche for a pastor to say this. Spiritual strength, sometimes it feels like vitamins instead of Tylenol, Laura, where if you need Tylenol, you need Tylenol, right? And a lot of us know that maybe vitamins or supplements are healthy, but you don't really notice if you take them or not. They just slowly make you stronger. And spiritual strength can be in that category. Sometimes we don't feel like we desperately need God's word or desperately need his affirmation in prayer, or desperately need times of worship or uh, just connection with others. But when I talked with these couples, what held them up is ultimately finding out, okay, we need God like we've never needed him before. And then they found out that God was capable and present in their greatest need. The couple that lost their only child talked about how important it was for both spouses to be strong. She said, when we first lost Garrett, it was 95 Joe and 5% me. I just fell apart. She says, I'd lost my son. Joe was the strong one. He was holding me up. He was speaking God's word. He was holding me there. And then they discovered that the second year was more painful than the first. The first year was a fog, tremendous grief. But it's like when you experience your second Christmas without your son and you realize, okay, this is permanent. When you experience your second Mother's Day or Father's Day and there's no card coming because your son is gone, now it just hits you in a new way. And so about 18 months in, Joe started to fall apart. And Janelle said at that point, it was 75-25, 75%. I was holding the marriage together. I was speaking into his life. I was encouraging him. And it really pointed out to me how because we get hit in different ways, we grieve in different ways, we face challenges in different ways. The importance of both spouses becoming spiritually strong, not taking that for granted. The day will come when my wife will really need me and may not be able to give much to me. And that's why I want to do the spiritual devotions. That's why I want to be steeped in God's word and worshiped up, if I could use that phrase, because I want to be there for her. And the same thing is she's diligent in Bible study. She's diligent in prayer. She's going to be there for me. And that that's one of the just tremendous joys of being married. You know, that Ezekiel talks about it. If one falls down, hopefully there's another one to pick that person up. And that's really what a Christian marriage is all about. The second thing, though, that won't sound maybe as much like a cliche is emotional connection. They not only wanted to stay connected to God, they were intentional about being connected to each other. And for this book, I really drew on the research and the writings of Dr. Archibald Hart and Dr. Sharon May. It was fun to read them because it's actually a father-daughter team. And it was just fun to read a book written from that relationship. But they, they really stressed emotional connection. And, and there were three things that identify emotional connection that he helped couples stay connected that you can work on, that you can identify, that can help you grow together. The first one is trust. Now, of course, it's speaking about trust. Is this person going to be faithful? But it goes beyond that. If you say you're going to do it, do it. Can you count on them to be home when they say they're going to be home? Can you count on them to call when they say they're going to call? The connection is I can't feel connected to you if I don't trust you, because I'm going to be suspicious of you. I'm going to be expecting you to not come through. And it's hard to give yourself to someone when you don't feel like they're going to come through. So trust is essential for intimacy. The second thing was emotional availability, that you're there emotionally for your spouse, which means if you're overly busy, you're not going to have enough bandwidth left over to be emotionally available. But you're there to receive their fears, to receive their concerns, to receive their questions, to receive even their their desire and their wanting to be connected to you in every way. And then sensitive responsiveness is when our spouse speaks, the first sentence out of our mouth is so important. For us guys, a lot of times our natural inclination is, oh, I can fix that, or oh, don't worry, that's not so bad, or you shouldn't take that so personally. That's the 
opposite of sensitive responsiveness. Sensitive responsiveness is, of course you were hurt. Of course you were offended. I'm so sorry you had to go through that. Man, that must have been scary. And, and that's what sort of draws our spouse to us. If your husband comes home and he's a little bit late, And you said, well, he's not supposed to break trust or whatnot. And he explains, well, you know what? I just, I had this project and they were screaming, oh, honey, I'm, I'm sorry. Of course, you were feeling a lot of pressure. You're working hard for us. It's such a difference. Even if you're frustrated, even if you know he still could have called, at least he could have texted. That might be true. But the key is, Lord, do you want to be connected to your spouse or do you want to win an argument with your spouse? And that's the key. These couples made the decision. We have a huge attack on our relationship right now. How do we get through this so that we're closer rather than farther? And it doesn't have to be a huge attack. It can be a little attack and you could learn to practice this so that when the big attack does come, you know what to do. You've learned how to respond with emotional availability and sensitive responsiveness these marital skills, like you said, they can be learned. We can grow in these. And in your book, you even liken it to professional athletes. They don't stop practicing once we feel like they've mastered one of their skills. They keep growing. Just to esteem my husband here, I cannot imagine a better spiritual leader. And he will pray with me. He'll be praying for me and our family. He follows through on parenting and disciplining our children And little things, sharing scripture that he's learning about, he'll share that with each of us. But really, if I had to boil it down, I think the thing that I appreciate most with his spiritual leadership is his relationship with the Lord. And the more he turns to God and relies on him and grows in his faith and worship and scripture reading, all of those things just overflow. Yeah. You're a blessed woman. That's an incredible... (laughs) Testimony. And what I love, Laura, is that all these couples, when I went to them, I really had to look and pray to find certain kind of couples because it wasn't just couples who had bad things happen to them. That's a depressing book. (laughs) It was wise couples who grew through that and they had wisdom to share and could help others. So one of the first questions was, what did you do wrong? And they all knew many things. Well, we shouldn't have done that. And at first we responded this way. And at first this wasn't helpful. Okay, then what did you learn to do right? This is what we did. And then what would you say to other couples who might be going through this? So none of them feel like, oh, we just we just have it down. We're just a perfect married couple. We just knew they they admitted this was a process. And and that's the hope I want to give couples. You may not respond with sensitive responsiveness the first time a situation arises. You might respond with fear rather than faith to another challenge. You might respond with bitterness rather than worship and hope. God has big shoulders. He understands what's going on. And what I love about marriage as God designed it is we have a lifetime together to learn how to get it right the next time. We might have messed up early on. We can grow. We can develop these things. We can rely on the Holy Spirit. We can become new people. And in becoming new people, we can become a new couple. I'm going to link also to an episode in September that was with Dr. Sharon May, who you mentioned. I think these conversations would pair nicely. Let's take a quick break to hear a message from our sponsor. I'm so excited to share today's sponsor, Windshape Marriage, with you. Windshape Marriage is a fantastic ministry that helps couples prepare, strengthen, and if needed, even save their marriage. Windshape Marriage is grounded on the belief that the strongest marriages are the ones that are nurtured, even if it seems like things are going smoothly. That way, they'll be stronger if they do hit a bump along their marital journey. Through their weekend retreats, Windshape Marriage invites couples to enjoy time away to simply focus on each other. These weekend retreats are hosted within the beautiful refuge of Windshape Retreat, perched in the mountains of Rome, Georgia, which is just a short drive from Atlanta, Birmingham, and Chattanooga. While you and your spouse are there, you'll be well-fed, well-nurtured, and well-cared for. During your time away in this beautiful place, you and your spouse will learn from expert speakers and explore topics related to intimacy, overcoming challenges, improving communication, and so much more. I've stayed on site at Windshape before, and I can attest to their generosity, food, and content. You will be so grateful you went. To find an experience that's right for you and your spouse, 
head to their website, winshapemarriage.org. That's W-I-N-S-H-A-P-E marriage.org. Thanks for your sponsorship. Even back to your book, Gary, you write about insights from Christian classics and one being how these classics, quote, stress how self-understanding is almost as important as an understanding of God, end quote. So will you just share more of what you mean by that? Yeah. Laura, I've been a lifelong student of the Christian classics. I love the Christian classics. They lift me out of my generation. They lift me out of my nationality. They lift me out of my gender blinders. I read women. I read people from different Christian traditions who lived in different countries in different times. And I think one of the most surprising teachings to me was how so many of them stressed the need for self-understanding, because that sounds narcissistic to me. It almost sounds selfish, but they explained how Jesus is, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And so many of us believe lies about ourselves, or we never examine ourselves. The psalmist says, search me, O God, and know my heart. You know, it, it, the prayers reveal to me what's really going on. Now, when we apply this to marriage, it becomes so powerful because when we get angry or we feel disrespected or anxious, it's easy to blame our spouse. You made me angry. This is why I'm anxious. You're not coming through on this or or this makes me feel disrespected. And I want to take a step back and say, why does this make me so angry? It makes me angry. Should it? Why am I so sensitive about feeling disrespected? Why do I turn to excessive gaming or eating or or this or that if I'm feeling anxiety? Most of these issues were set in place long before we met our spouse. A couple of guys that I talked to for this book talked about how when they were looking at porn, it, it didn't have anything to do with their wife in this sense. I know it's traumatic for a wife. It's terrible for a wife. I'm not saying that. But what they're saying is that it wasn't that there was anything lacking in my wife. In fact, one husband said, I had found what I thought was the perfect Christian wife. She was amazing. And I was convinced I wasn't good enough for her. He goes, so it's like I was acting out just to get it over with. Well, eventually she's going to find me out and she's going to leave me. So why don't I just force her hand? And, and so I encourage to ask, why does this make me so angry? Why does this do it? I, I went through this with my own therapist, and I don't have a lot of childhood memories. But one thing that many of them had in common that really began to put together was some of my most vivid memories are getting blamed for things I didn't do. In the neighborhood one time, with my parents one time, at school, one time an undercover security guy accused me of shoplifting, and I didn't. I mean, it was all of these things where I grew up thinking the truth isn't secure because I can still be blamed and sometimes even punished for something I didn't do. And so even to this day, the accusation can bring tremendous anxiety up. And it happened to me at a season of my life where it seemed like God allowed that to happen from many different sectors so that as an adult, I could face down when I didn't have the abilities as a child to understand it, to go to God for comfort, to psychologically think through it. I was just a victim to this anxiety with false accusations. To this day, Laura, I still am too unsettled by accusations. It's often based on pride. It's putting my own reputation up there instead of wanting just to speak about the glorious name of Christ. But it's helpful for me to know why. So that if my wife accuses me of something I didn't do, which happened yesterday, she's a wonderful woman. She wouldn't mind me saying this, but uh, we'd had dinner uh, scheduled with a couple. And she says, yeah, by the way, Rita told me we had dinner and you didn't tell me about it. I said, well, actually, honey, uh, I did twice. Remember this and this? She goes, Oh, yeah. But but see, that would used to just set me up. What do you mean I didn't? And it would be all out of proportion because my wife is just touching this deep childhood hurt that hadn't been brought out into the light. And so I need to know myself. I need to know where I'm weak. I need to know where I'm vulnerable and realize it isn't my wife's fault. Uh, Put it this way. If you have a bruise on your arm, and your spouse hugs you and presses that bruise, 
you're going to scream, ow, that hurt me. Why did you do that? Well, if your spouse didn't know the bruise was there, if it wouldn't have hurt, if there wasn't a bruise, that's not your spouse's fault. It was your own hurt that you haven't dealt with. Now, it's still appropriate to tell yourself, hey, don't press there. I'm sensitive here. This hurts. But it's also just giving your spouse the benefit of the doubt, realizing we're hurt people. Laura, we are tremendously hurt. That when, when I talk to these couples and you get into the stories how so many of them limped into marriage. Let me give some examples. One was Stacy. She grew up in a dysfunctional home. And so she just wanted a strong guy. And so she fell in love with Daryl. He was a weightlifter. Or he could bench press 400 pounds, which it's a lot of weight. An NFL lineman would be happy being able to bench press 400 pounds. And that was what she was looking for. Three years after they were married, he was diagnosed with MS and has lived for decades in either a walker, a wheelchair, and now in a scooter. Her worst fears came true. And she realized that she had to let go of that deep need of needing that security. And she had to realize, I'm secure, not because I married a strong man. I'm secure because I worship a strong God. And she expected that her husband would always protect her. And she realized, okay, now I'm learning. God wants me to focus on him and what he can do. Another man that I talked to, I referred to him before who had an issue with porn. He never felt loved by his parents. He was just sort of ostracized in his family and his birth order and whatnot. And then he was molested as a boy. I, I talked to a counselor in Houston who specializes in this. He reviewed the book for me and he told me, whenever I hear of a boy being molested in a counseling session, I just wait for the dominoes to fall. He says, I can almost write his future. That's not to ever excuse anybody for acting out. But the reality is he never got professional care for that. He never had somebody help him deal with the conflicting emotions, the guilt, the shame, the, the tremendous abuse that he faced. And so he stumbles into marriage and it's not a surprise that he acted out. It doesn't excuse him for acting out, but it explains why he needed to know himself. Okay, this is where I'm weak. This is where I've been hurt. And this is how it's going to impact my marriage if I don't deal with it. Another one, let me use another woman, Emily. She actually has a higher libido than her husband. And her husband was pretty normal in his sexual desire. He was happy to have sex three or four times a week. She actually wanted it every day or even a couple times a day. And she felt tremendous shame and frustration when her husband didn't like it. She'd say to him, do you have any idea how most husbands would act if they had a wife like me? And he just honestly didn't feel like he could keep up with her. And she went into counseling and there was some trauma from her past. The counselor put her in EMDR training, which has been so helpful for so many and, and dealt with some codependency issues. And she had to get counseling to become more secure in her husband's love because she realized there were many ways my husband was loving me. But I had reduced it to one thing. If he loves me, he wants to be sexual with me. And through that training and getting through the codependency, she was able to see, no, my, my husband shows his love for me in multiple ways. Sexual intimacy is just one aspect of how I can receive his love, but it's not the only one by far. And it dramatically transformed their marriage, even though they weren't having more sex. It's that she had done that inner work. Okay. This is why I feel so desperate for it. This is why I get so anxious when it doesn't happen. But this is why I don't think that's healthy. And I need to look at other ways that he's affirming me. So by understanding themselves, they were able to give themselves more fully to their spouse and create an entirely different marriage. Absolutely. You can just see how intimacy is ushered in both with God and with their spouse when they have that healthy level of self-understanding. So that's very helpful. And some of those stories were talking about times when expectations were not met. 
So Gary, what is your advice when expectations aren't met in marriage? Well, first, let me just say they won't be. <laughs> Almost all of us have expectations that go far beyond. Uh, let me do it there on Stacey again, the couple where the husband was diagnosed with MS. He expected to be strong for his wife, to wrestle around with his kids. He wanted to be there for her. That was part of his identity. And when he was diagnosed with MS, his prayer was, Heal me, heal me, heal me, heal me. He had a two-word prayer every time. God, you got to heal me from this. Until finally he felt like God stopped him and said, Daryl, I'm going to heal you, but not of MS. In fact, I'm going to use MS to heal what really needs to be healed. There are deeper issues in your life than having MS right now. And, and this is why, Laura, I just felt like a student blessed with these really wise, godly people who have grown so far in the faith because of the difficulties that, that they have faced down. And so Daryl ha has just had a whole new understanding. And then Stacy, when, of course, she wanted the strong husband, her expectation was he's going to take care of me. She said her first response was fear. These are my worst fears. I can't believe this is going to happen until decades later. They were at a dinner. Daryl's in a wheelchair at this point. Good friends, good food, and they were all laughing. And it's one of those special moments that God gives us where it's like he tapped Stacy on the shoulder and said, see, Stacy, your worst fears came true, that your husband would be very much disabled. And yet you're having fun. You have friends. You and Daryl are still connected. Yeah, you, you need to leave at eight because Daryl needs to get in bed early. And that's when Stacy told me, Gary, I realized my fear did more damage to my marriage than MS did to my marriage. And, and I hear these phrases. And I, these aren't people who are speaking platitudes. They have lived through it. And then I, I think the expectations that Daryl had, just that he would be there, that he wouldn't have to depend on his wife. And he turned it around. He could be so bitter. He could say, God, how, how come I can't even get myself ready for bed? He talks about he can get his scooter up to the bed. And his arms have enough strength where he can pull his body up, but he can't get his legs over. So Stacy has to come and move his legs over. And it would be easy for him to be bitter and frustrated. I hate this. Instead, here's what Daryl told me. And this is, again, the quality of these couples I talked to. He said, Gary, MS gives me a reason to be thankful for Stacy about 100 times a day. I'm so grateful for her. It makes me so thankful. I'm overflowing with thankfulness because I need her to do so much. And then this was this was something I'll never forget that has changed my life talking to this couple. Daryl said it would have been easy for him just to say, hey, Stace, why don't you just lift me up? You know, it, it hurts my arms anyway. He goes, but no, I, I can do that. So I want to do that. And he said, Gary, maybe I can only do 20% of what I used to be able to do physically but I'm determined I will do 100% of that 20%. And he's not going to just, in bitterness, just give it, fine, I can't do it, it, it's done. He was willing to say, I'm going to do everything that I can and then thank God for that and experience fully all that life. My expectations have been blown apart, but that doesn't mean I'm going to make it worse than it needs to be. And so when I was talking with a husband who had gone through prostate cancer, had a prostate removed, which can really complicate physical intimacy in a marriage, and it'd be so easy for a couple to say, well, we can't do everything we used to do, so let's, let's throw up our arms, poor us, forget it. I'm not trying to downplay it, but what I would say to them, okay, maybe you can only do 40% of what you used to do. Do 100% of that 40%. Enjoy every bit that you are able to do. Your expectations won't be met. But th this is where when Paul says, I've learned to be content in every circumstance. One, one of the husbands with the higher libido said this. He goes, look, I still don't get as much sex as I would like, but I'm getting so much more. And if I focused on what I wasn't getting, it would wreck the sex we do have. And he says, and why is libido different than in everything else? I wish I earned $50,000 more a year than I do, but I don't want to then not be grateful for the money that I do earn. Putting the light on your expectations and not letting your expectations steal your joy 
is an essential spiritual discipline if you want to have a happy life and a connected marriage. There is an exciting project taking place behind the scenes right now, and I would love to invite you to participate. I will give you more details as I'm able, but for now, here's my request. Will you email me your personal story of a specific way God has clearly shown up in your life? Big or small, I want to hear an account of the way He made Himself known to you and maybe received credit for an answered prayer, or a way He worked out a situation in a miraculous way, or how He displayed His power in your life. There is no limit to the type of story to submit, as long as it's true. So please email me your story at this email address, info at thesavvysauce.com. I can't wait to read your story. Thanks for sharing. This is so good. I feel like this entire conversation is such a healthy and helpful paradigm shift, and it's full of truth and positivity, and it feels applicable. But then when I'm summing up your one of your goals of your book, there was just one part that especially stuck with me. And you said that one of your goals of the book is to increase connection and intention. So how can we grow our marriage in both of those areas? Yeah, well, here's some questions. If you want to increase connection and intention, here's some questions that you can ask each other. If I were to ask you, what are your spouse's current greatest temptation? Would you know what it is? And the thing is, if, if it was, no, I'm afraid to go there, then you don't really know your spouse. What's their greatest frustration? There's one thing that really frustrates them on a regular basis. Do you know what that is? I mean, if you want to be kind and loving and help address it, if you don't even know what it is, how are you going to face it? What is your spouse's greatest fear? And what I found, Laura, is that we think we know our spouses, but we don't. Because the reality is our spouses change. I say this to husbands all the time. You know, you date her, and in dating, you're asking the questions. Tell me about where you grew up. Tell me about your parents. Tell me about your story. Tell me about what happened to you. And then we just lose our curiosity. But what I say to guys is, you know what, getting married really changes a woman. So if you don't figure out, okay, what are your greatest frustrations now? It's going to be different than when she was single or dating or engaged. I said, having a child dramatically changes a woman. Not being able to conceive a child if she wants to dramatically changes a woman. Seeing a child now no longer need her. (laughs) Not being a toddler anymore or becoming an empty nester or having grandchildren. Every one of these stages of life, your spouse is becoming a new person. You've got to have that same curiosity you have when you're dating to stay connected. We need to know each other. And I think that's what we want, Laura. We just want to be known. And so initially, Lisa and I are faced. We just moved from Houston to Colorado. And may have been a mistake. We decided to gut this house because we loved the property. It looks out on a public area that's just beautiful. For us, evening walks are really key to what we do, a deck where we could look out on a greenway. I mean, it was just so important to us. But the house was built in 1971 and looks like it. I mean, just old, ugly carpeting and low ceilings and all that. So we're dealing with that. I'm not the best husband for renovation because my wife held up two white boards at a cabinet place recently. She said, which one do you like better? I was like, is this a test? (laughs) She goes, what do you mean? I go, they're identical. (laughs) I literally saw zero. She goes, no, they're not. This is eggshell wider. This is ivory. I'm like, Honey, for the life, I, they honestly, they look exactly the same. And then the salesman is in on it. Well, of course, the one on the right is a little bit warmer. Now, as an English major, I, words matter to me. And I want to say, dude, colors have shades, not temperatures. What are you talking about? This doesn't make, I completely failed that test. But my wife is really anxious about making a wrong decision. We probably have enough samples for the wood floor where we could finish the floors with samples if we wanted to do a patchwork. So my question is, honey, why 
does this matter so much? Not to just be frustrated, but what is it about choosing the right floor that causes so much pressure or anxiety or concern? Who is it that you're afraid won't like it? What what does that mean? It's easy to be irritated about it or to make light of it. If I want us to grow through the process of building a house so that we're also building our marriage, I've got to get into that mode. Okay, what's going on? Tell me, tell me what you're facing. Not in a condemning way, not in a I'm more mature way. I, I'm very likely immature. Maybe I don't see what's important in a way that she does. And so it's really getting into that. And then I think what's important, this is long term for a marriage, but I think it's a key question. Would you be able to tell me your spouse's greatest dreams for the next week, the next month, the next year, and maybe a bucket list before they die. And that's an amazing thing where you just say, you know what, I, I do I even know what they aspire to? They've worked so hard. You know, the Bible says the prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Mm-hmm. Let me tell you, I am in awe of the prayer of a righteous woman. <laughs> Because I have a friend whose wife has written a great book on prayer. If you want a great show on prayer, Sherry Harney, Praying with Eyes Wide Open, it's a phenomenal book on prayer. She is a woman of prayer. And she went to her husband and said, what's on your bucket list? He's a pastor in California, an avid golfer. And he said, nah, I don't know. I've not able to do most of it. He goes, well, yeah, I guess if I could ever play Augusta, which is like the <laughs> most story golf. But but he goes, look, that's impossible. It can't happen. So I guess I don't really have anything. Well, she's a woman of prayer. And God answered that prayer. He He doesn't know it as we're talking. He'll know it by the time that this is aired, where she was able to find a member, which is just so difficult to do. And she said to that member, look, will pay for the hotel knife. He goes, what are you talking about? If you're going to play Augusta, you have to stay at Augusta. So my friend for his 60th birthday is going to spend the night at Augusta and eat at the Augusta clubhouse and then go play 18 holes at Augusta. I mean, it was just, I was just like, I am in awe. (laughs) Okay. If I ever need a prayer request, Sherry, I'm coming straight to you. If you can pull this off, there's not, but I just love this attitude of, you know what? My my husband has loved me. He's fathered our kids. He works hard for us. He's been there for me. What dream of his can I make come true? And when my wife was done with raising our kids, we became empty nesters. And she had worked so hard, Laura. She was a homeschooling mom up through eighth grade. And, and she just cared for them. Food really matters to her, their health, their education, and sacrificing for all of that. And so we were at a point where that she was done that stage in her life. I said, all right, hon, you have served our family so well. I just want you to know whatever you think God is calling you to do now, if you want to go back to school, if you want to start a business, if you want to, if you don't want to do anything, that's what you've, you've earned it. I just want you to know I am here to help this next stage of your life dream come true. And so we're exploring what does she really want to do? What is she looking forward to? to doing. And that's where I just think we take our spouses for granted. They've been there. They work for us. They've been by our side. And I think there needs to come a time when we need to figure out, well, what is it that I can do that would really honor that? If we don't do that, we gradually become strangers. It would grieve me if my wife had fears or dreams that I didn't know about. I should be the one that helps her face those fears and also help her achieve those dreams. Wow. Gary, just all of these insightful questions that you include in the book and all of these stories, I just found it to be profoundly helpful. And I hope people are going to pick up a copy and read it alongside their spouse. I think a lot of growth and enjoyment can come from doing this together. But if we want to learn more from you, where would you direct us to go online after this conversation? Well, my website is my name, GaryThomas.com, GaryThomas.com. But for interaction, I'm hanging out mostly on Substack, and that's GaryThomasBooks.Substack.com. And we'll be posting excerpts from the book, some video interviews with couples featured in the book. So couples won't just read about these couples. They'll get to see them and hear from them. And I'm looking forward to that because, Lord, I just, I'm just in awe of God's power to work through individuals and couples 
And it's like my life has been changed by spending time with them, most of whom we didn't even get to talk about in this interview, but I want others to get to know them. Here's this incredible thing. It's like, you know, when you're excited about a movie or something, oh, you got to see it. It's like I'm excited about these people and what God has done in their life. And so making your marriage a fortress is really just a collection of these stories of these couples, the wisdom they've learned how they've grown closer, and what we can gain from their wisdom in the process. Wonderful. Well, we will link to all of that in the show notes for today's episodes to make it easy to access. And Gary, this is your third time on The Savvy Sauce. (laughs) So you know that we're called The Savvy Sauce because savvy is synonymous with practical knowledge. And so as my final question for you today, what is your savvy sauce? Where I have been compelled by God to bring savvy sauce to my life is doubling down on reading. Uh, It's becoming a lost art in our culture today, but when I read in scripture, Proverbs 4, 7 through 9, the beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom. Though it costs all you have, get understanding. Cherish her and she will exalt you. Embrace her and she will honor you. She will give you a garland to grace your head and present you with a glorious crown. And so the teacher says that it will cost you something to get wisdom, but consider listening to some podcasts, double down on a couple sermons a week, open that book before you click on to Netflix, just decide that wisdom is so key in parenting, in marriage, in life, in your finances. So often we talk about Jesus's power, his healing. What I think we don't stress enough is Jesus's brilliance. Mm. That when he was a 12-year-old boy, that the teachers were amazed at his understanding and wisdom. When he was an adult, the scriptures stress how people were astonished at the depth of his teachings. No one has talked like this before. Jesus was kind and loving and courageous and sacrificial but he was also brilliant and we could read his words and we can read those who talk about his words. And and for me, I think to be a fully formed person, I have to do what Paul says in Romans 12 too, not to be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of my mind. And I think that begins with becoming an avid reader. Wow. Well, Gary, it is always a joy to get to spend time hearing your teaching because you've labored for hours over these topics and you've used that wisdom to then encourage each of us to prioritize that intention and connection in our own marriages. And I believe that we're all better off from learning from you today. So thank you so much for your work and thank you for being my returning guest. Thank you, Laura. It's always an honor to be with you. One more thing before you go. Have you heard the term gospel before? It simply means good news, and I want to share the best news with you. But it starts with the bad news. Every single one of us were born sinners, and God is perfect and holy, so he cannot be in the presence of sin. Therefore, we're separated from him. This means there's absolutely no chance we can make it to heaven on our own. So for you and for me, it means we deserve death and we can never pay back the sacrifice we owe to be saved. We need a savior. But God loved us so much, he made a way for his only son to willingly die in our place as the perfect substitute. This gives us hope of life forever in right relationship with him. That is good news. Jesus lived the perfect life we could never live and died in our place for our sin. This was God's plan to make a way to reconcile with us so that God can look at us and see Jesus. We can be covered and justified through the work Jesus finished if we choose to receive what he has done for us. Romans 10 9 says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So would you pray with me now? Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to take our place. I pray someone today, right now, is touched and chooses to turn their life over to you. Will you clearly guide them and help them take their next step in faith to declare you as Lord of their life? 
We trust you to work and change the lives now for eternity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, you are declaring, Him for me, so me for Him. You get the opportunity to live your life for Him. At this podcast, we are called Savvy for a reason. We want to give you practical tools to implement the knowledge you have learned. So you're ready to get started? First, tell someone. Say it out loud. Get a Bible. The first day I made this decision, my parents took me to Barnes & Noble to get the Quest NIV Bible, and I love it. Start by reading the book of John. Get connected locally, which basically means just tell someone who is part of the church in your community that you made a decision to follow Christ. I'm assuming they will be thrilled to talk with you about further steps, such as going to church and getting connected to other believers to encourage you. We want to celebrate with you too, so feel free to leave a comment for us if you made a decision for Christ. We also have show notes included where you can read scripture that describes this process. Finally, be encouraged. Luke 15.10 says, In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The heavens are praising with you for your decision today. If you've already received this good news, I pray that you have someone else to share it with today. You are loved, and I look forward to meeting you here next time.